Mary Wong, and I am a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and acupuncturist in downtown Toronto, owner and founder of Alive Holistic Health Clinic and author of Pathways to Pregnancy. Tonight, um, I want to welcome you to my live post number 58. And the reason why the number is backwards is because I've been holding sp the space for an interview with Natasha, who I'll introduce to you in a moment. But unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, we had some technical difficulties as I was away. Um, so here we are doing the interview again. But before we start, I want to acknowledge that on October 15th, just three days ago, there is a Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. So I want to honor this day and uh, through this week and through this live interview. And I want to say that, you know, I fully get and I've been there where sometimes when you see pregnant women or little infant babies or even just babies in general, sometimes it's like this, like a stab to the heart because it's something that you desire so badly that you do not have and you look at other people and it is seemingly like everybody else has one except for you. And seemingly it's like everybody can have a baby very easily except for you. So I'm here to tell you today that when you see that pregnant belly or that little infant or that little baby being pushed in the stroller, consider that not all of these women had it easy. And that's why I'm brought, I have brought in Natasha and I'm going to introduce her to you right now. And, um, thank you for being here, Natasha. Um, you've been seeing me as a patient for a little while, and I'm, I'm going to let you do more of the speaking about your story. But I want people to have some hope because you have a pretty incredible story. And um, I wanted people to identify with you as a face rather than just another person that, oh, yeah, I hear about it, but, you know, really doesn't happen. Well, I, I'm hoping that this will provide a bit more hope. So welcome, Natasha, and thank you so much for telling your story, one that is, you know, private and close to heart. So thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Mary, and just let me know if the sound quality isn't what you need it to be, okay? So thank you for saying that. For some reason, I, we, I hear you, but um, you're frozen a little bit. So maybe you're going to be frozen off and on visually, but as long as we can hear your voice, we're good to go. Okay, just let me know if I need to repeat anything. Okay, sounds good. So tell us, um, how long has your journey been? And um, when did you start trying to conceive? I started trying to conceive almost exactly two years ago. And I knew right away that I was going to have problems because I wasn't getting my period. And I'm someone who's been on the birth control since I was 15 years old. And I'm someone who works in the field of classical dance, where we have a lot of issues with women who are of different body weights and have delayed periods. So I immediately went to my doctor and let her know that there was a problem. And she sent me to, um, to a fertility clinic to create right away. And I was very grateful for that because I didn't have to wait the year that traditionally people wait for before they go to a clinic. But I was told that my condition, which is called PCOS, polycystic ovary system syndrome, would be very easy to cure through a series of oral medications that were administered. And they did their work. I was having periods every five weeks or so. But for reasons they couldn't explain, nothing was working and I wasn't conceiving. And it was one of those situations where I wasn't sure if I was even ready to have a baby, but as soon as it became an issue that I could not, I wanted one more and more with each month and got increasingly devastated. And about six months down the line, one of my dear friends who is actually going to be my baby's godmother recommended that I try acupuncture. And the company she recommended was up in Richmond Hill, so I wouldn't be able to access them. So I Googled your company and I'm so... Grateful that I did. Yep, good old Google. 
Exactly. That's why, that's why I'm laughing. Good old Google. <laughs> it is. They've been wonderful. And I love your Google talk as well. And what I noticed immediately, I actually saw your colleague, David, at first. And uh, I noticed immediately in the first session that I was feeling changes. Like I felt like I was spinning and I could almost feel like eggs dropping in my ovaries. And I felt all this powerful stuff. And I'm someone who is not really sort of a, a believer in alternative systems necessarily. I just thought I will give this a try. And I couldn't deny that immediately um, my periods became even more regular and the blood was much more healthy. And I felt so calm after every session. It was just like floating out of there and I needed some calmness in my life. Um, but as you know, months and months kept going by. And again, no one could explain what was happening or why nothing was working. And then you sent me to see a naturopath, um, Fiona McCulloch's office, White Lotus Clinic. Um, I'm seeing Erica Nikki Fork there and they are PCOS specialists. And the first thing Erica noticed was that um, I was having about 30% of the protein that I needed on a daily basis. And she said, this is a huge issue and we need to address this right away. And as soon as we did, three or four months later was when I conceived. Now, it's not to say that was the one factor. I know there are many factors and that might not have been it. It might just be a coincidence, but I genuinely believe that the combination of seeing a fertility specialist, having acupuncture sessions just set my whole body up so it was ready that when that one thing finally presented itself as a possible solution, the rest of my mind and my body were ready for this thing to happen. That's the only way I can explain it because the procedure that finally worked was a procedure I had done three other times previously. Okay, so let's um, add in to give the full breadth of the picture because when you came, you were also devastated because one of your options was to drill, do, do a procedure called ovarian drilling, right? Mm. And so that you were seriously contemplating that. And then you're also seriously contemplating IVF, in vitro fertilization. And so how close did you get to both of these before you became pregnant on your own? I was due for ovarian drilling two days after I got my positive pregnancy test. But to be honest, I don't know if I would have gone through with the drilling. As you know, I was still having serious doubts and almost panic attacks because I'm someone who's very reticent to try a lot of serious intervention. I wasn't ready for that emotionally, but I thought it's been almost two years. Nothing's worked. I need to just push myself to this next level, even if I'm not ready. And so the fact that I got the positive two days before means that I was able to avoid a situation that ultimately I wasn't actually ready for and I was forcing myself into it. Mm -hmm. and, and for those who do not know, um, ovarian drilling is, you know, it's, it's pretty extreme, right? It, like it's as it means you, you drill into the ovary and to try to activate it. And um, it's used for uh, extreme cases of PCOS. They used to do it more commonly, but I haven't really seen um, people undergoing this procedure much anymore. And um, I did... Uh, I, gosh, my time frame is a little off maybe, but maybe like two years ago, I had a patient that did do this and it did work for her. But, you know, again, hard to know, was it the ovarian drilling or was it that she just conceived naturally because she was balanced once again, because she conceived naturally after the ovarian drilling, but she was also doing acupuncture and other lifestyle and dietary changes at the time as well. So it's hard to know, right? It is. You just never know what's going to work. And I think that's why this process was definitely so frustrating for me. A, I didn't know how long this would take. Like if someone told me at the beginning, oh, a year and a half from now, something's going to work, then I'd have a timeline. But realistically, we just don't know month to month if it's going to work. And we don't know what's going to work because a lot of it just can't be explained. So we might try the same thing three or five times and then the sixth time it works well what was different that time we do, we don't really know and I think that's what makes this kind of process really disheartening for many people I would say for all people <laughs> not just for many right 
having gone through it myself. But um, the other piece I want to add in there for those watching is that really fertility issues and challenges can happen at any age. And here you're talking about, gee, I wasn't even 100% sure if I was ready or if I even wanted children. But it's also interesting that when push comes to shove, when there's an actual like a threat that you cannot, all of a sudden that desire becomes even that much stronger. Do you agree? It absolutely, does. It absolutely does. And yes, that's part of my personality or maybe everyone's. If you're told you can't have something, then you want it. But we're always working against a ticking clock. And even when I did manage to conceive, when I went in to see my doctor, he said, okay, I need you back here a year from now if you want to have a second child, because after that, you're going to be 35 and it's going to be even more difficult. And I just thought, oh my God, I finally conceived. I'm just worrying about this pregnancy. And then I have to already start worrying about, can I put myself through this again? And what do I need to do to... So the ticking clock is very much a big issue. And I am lucky that I'm on the right side of 35 for a few more months, but... Um, Really, I, I wouldn't say that that should be a deterrent. I think we focus on age a lot more than it should. And definitely there were a lot of women at the clinic who conceived much more quickly than I did. And they were much older than I was. Yeah, exactly. And, and so really age, I'm not going to say it doesn't have anything to do with it because as we know, there are statistics and research. However, you know, again, I always say, don't let yourself be defined by your age. And um, as we have seen in your case, things can change, things can shift. And, you know, whatever the diagnosis is, there's the ability to heal. And, you know, in your way of eating differently and having a lifestyle differently and taking measures to de-stress, it all made a huge difference. And here you are today. And, you know, sometimes for some people, it, it's, it may be very quickly after these lifestyle dietary changes. And for others, it it's still a guessing game. It's like, okay, now I've changed this and now my period cycle seems normal, but it's still six months later and I'm still not pregnant. And the focus is still on the pathology. And I say, you know, can we revisit this and say, you know, even with the term infertility, the definition is when you're unable to conceive spontaneously within a year's time. So if you're completely off balance and then you finally get more towards balance so even if it's six months out that you've just started to have more regular cycles and um like a better healthier attitude and a decrease of stress if you're six months into it you're actually still in the normal time frame of trying to conceive like you haven't you know even though perhaps You've been trying for two and a half years. Do you get what I'm saying when I say that? Absolutely. And I really, um, I would say that aside from the increasing amounts of medication and procedures that I wasn't comfortable with, I in no way regret any of the changes that I made or any of the different avenues I pursued because all of it has helped my health so much and all of it made me feel better, which I needed at a time that I felt my absolute worst. So it was really only just trying to come to terms with how much medication am I willing to put into my body or treatments that make me feel worse? Am I willing to sacrifice for this goal? And I am in awe of all of the women who do these very invasive things, such as yourself, because honestly, I, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't ready to do it for myself. Well, thankfully, you didn't have to do that. And um so thank you for saying that because I do honor all the women that are the warriors of going in and getting injectables every single day, going to the clinic, but you've gone to the clinic, you've done cycle monitoring and that's hellhole right there, <laughs> right? It's not very fun, but then to, no. add, mm -hmm, and then to add to that drugs and then um, having to navigate work and that's just so difficult. It is. And I have to say that um, your book, when I started to read it, I was reading it on the streetcar on the way back from seeing you. And that was probably a mistake because I started crying. 
<laughs> because the first, I think it was one of the first chapters and you talked about a woman going to a clinic and everyone just sat there silently not talking to anyone and we were all kind of in our private hells and I just thought this is me this is every single morning right now and to just have it written out and it just made it acknowledged and validated how I was feeling and that so many other people go through this it really gave me a lot of emotional support in a very tangible way because I wasn't even going to a support group yet because to me that meant admitting that there was a serious problem which makes no sense. Obviously, there's a serious problem and these people would understand that. But I thought, no, if I do that, then I'm officially admitting that I have an issue here. Yeah, that was a big deal for me. Wow. Well, thank you. But wow. Uh, you know what, though? Amazing that you read my book uh, on public transit because I've actually had patients tell me they don't do that because they don't they worry about people seeing the title. Oh, absolutely. And even when you asked me to do this talk today, I thought, okay, am I ready to do that? Am I ready for someone to potentially recognize me or know that I have this issue? And because it's very, it's very personal. I think I only told maybe five close friends. I only told a few family members because it still feels like something that I was really embarrassed about, which I know doesn't make any sense, but it was admitting that there was something wrong with me that I couldn't fix. So again, thank you for being here. And I didn't realize that only a handful of people or less than a handful of people know about um, your journey. So wow, to come on here to tell your story, that is so heartfelt. And I'm sure everyone that's watching this really appreciates your input and your honesty and your journey, because I think you do make a difference. And, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm doing this every week so that we can help to make a difference for everyone that goes through this. You know, I've been there, you've been there. So I think we could all stick together and help each other out, right? So thank you. And I think what's worth mentioning also is that when I did start to announce my pregnancy, and again, much later than people would usually would, and they were kind of looking at me like, you're looking a little bigger. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I have to tell people now. And I have to say, um, maybe one out of every three people I told shared a story that they struggled to conceive. And these were very good friends of mine. And I felt terrible that I didn't know this about them and that they didn't feel like they could confide in their friends. But I thought I was in the same situation. I only told people who have seen me at my absolute worst. I was not in the habit of telling people, nor am I still. Like when people say, oh, you're pregnant, I don't say, oh, well, I had a really difficult time of it um, and I didn't realize there were so many of my friends that had gone through this and just didn't feel comfortable talking about it wow that's really amazing that you shared this so again still like there the then people really don't know right the reality because when you don't talk about your journey people have that automatic assumption that it was just easy and this is definitely not so and you said it like you know one out of three friends whereas and statistically, we say one in six. So I, I say it's actually higher than that, right? But people just still don't talk about it. I think so. And one of my very good friends as well um, was speaking to me maybe about six or seven months before I conceived. And we were having this talk. And she said, I didn't know you were going through this. And she said, I wonder if I have an issue too, because I've been trying to conceive for several years. And I only get my period very irregularly. And I wonder if this might be PCOS. So she got it treated. And I think within three months she was pregnant. So if I hadn't told her my story, I don't know how long it would have taken. And so I, looking forward, I do want to think about how can I target um, women who, who are perhaps on the birth control pill and don't know that they have PCOS because we're so focused on trying to not get people pregnant within a certain time frame of their life. And then by the time that we're ready or thinking of being ready, we're in our 30s and we don't know there's a problem. By the time we get treated, you're getting pretty close to the age where you have to really start going to these very extreme measures. Yes. And very quickly, too, especially when you're yeah. to the fertility clinic quickly. So they don't they don't give you much of a chance. It's like, OK, let's go straight into uh, insemination. Let's get it going because you're not getting any younger. Right. Because, of course, they drill the age into you. And like yeah, they do. 
So then you go into a panic mode and how helpful is that, right? Not. So yeah, thank you for that as well. And so then in light of that, I would love to share with you, um, uh, the, all the viewers, in terms of, I did a post uh, a while back, I don't know the number offhand, but I interviewed Lisa Marie and she does um, fertility awareness. She has a podcast called Fertility, Fr fertility Friday. And I think that's a good resource for people that are uh, maybe one day thinking of conceiving or just starting out um, just to t really look at the fertility awareness on your own. And of course, I would always say, and as far as doing things like acupuncture, because acupuncture also regulates um, the menstrual cycle and you know, people with endometriosis or other kinds of menstrual disorders or um, disruptors, uh, it can be helped through these kinds of methodologies. And certainly there's other kinds of modalities, which includes, as you had mentioned, naturopathic medicine, there's um, our Vigo Mayan massage, which is actually an ad abdominal massage. That's also helpful to um, motivate and move the reproductive organs and then some. So there's just lots of methodologies out there to help um, restore or rebalance so that, you know, there's a saying in Chinese medicine, we need to cultivate the soil before we plant the seed. And that's exactly what you did. But, you know, prior to coming to us, you weren't necessarily in that mode. It's like we go in blindly wanting to conceive. And it's like, oh, I never thought that I had to look at this and this and this that can contribute, like my um, exercise level, either too much or too little. And gee, you know, how about my menstrual cycle, right? Like, you know, maybe it can change versus just saying this is how it is. Absolutely. And I still... Like, I'm not out of this because I do want to have a second child and I don't know, like, can I put myself back through this or how long could I do that for? Because the fact is, all of my menstrual cycles were artificially induced to a certain point and absolutely the diet and acupuncture was supporting that. But ultimately, I would get my period once or twice a year maximum. So that's kind of my current reality. I don't know how that's going to shift, um, but it is a really... A scary situation to be in right so you know what actually just laid out for everybody so when you say um you were um given drugs what what were you given to promote your menstrual cycle because you weren't naturally even with all the changes mm -hmm. so there were two that were tried um one was Framara. And one was Clomid. Um, and then the other thing that was given to me, um, it was the name of the diabetes medication. And I had to stop it because I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't handle it. And uh, it was one of those things that I said, I don't have diabetes, so why am I on it? And that one's a bit more controversial anyway. Um, but all of these medications would sometimes work, but there were a couple of cycles that they didn't. And there was a lot of uh, very extreme side effects that would change from month to month. So I never knew how to expect anything. And basically I felt better in my first trimester of pregnancy than I did on all these various medications that were altering my hormone levels, which were not so great to, to begin with. So again, it was not something I was happy doing to my body, but I felt like it was a sacrifice that I just had to make. Sure. And so the medication you're talking about is metformin, which is a very common medication. Thank you, metformin. Yes, I've blocked it because I have PTSD with metformin. <laughs> yeah, you have, um, do you remember uh, your side effects from that? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a diabetes. Yeah they use for women with PCOS, right? And it's yes. for helping um, blood sugar because blood sugar has an impact on um, the menstrual cycle. And if you've heard um, my last couple of posts, and in fact, one of them was with Dr. Fiona McCullough, and then one was Alan View, uh, we talked about um, uh, treatments of PCOS and metformin was one of the things and how maybe we can utilize something else. Sometimes you can take it together with other Chinese, uh, um, other um, supplements or herbs, and that's possible. But in your case, you had symptoms and you actually went off of it. So how long were you on it? And when did you go off of it? And how long were you off before you conceived? 
I was only able to handle a half dose and I had to stop even that after three months. Um, it just completely disrupted my digestive system and I was having all of these crazy sensations and side effects and including during acupuncture sessions, it made my skin so sensitive. I don't know if you remember, I would start crying because I couldn't even handle the feeling of the needles, which never bothered me normally. So I thought I anybody. <laughs> Let's hypothesis you were in a heightened state of sensory, yes. like your, your, your skin sensory was height, hyper, height, oh, heightened. And then, but normally, as you were just trying the to say. Treatments were extremely soothing. So I just thought, okay, I can't do any of these supplementary treatments. I can't even take a full dose of this medication. That doesn't seem to be helping me anyway. What am I doing? So I just stopped it. And I actually started taking Ovacetol at, um, at the White Lotus Clinic's recommendation. And that was very helpful. I didn't find it had any adverse side effects. It really um, helped my blood sugar levels because I kept having those levels tested. And I just had them tested again a few weeks ago. And apparently they're the lowest they've ever been. So the diet changes as well really helped that. Um, but I, I, I don't know about metformin for me, it, it didn't work. Um, but I have heard people that it, it really does work well. But my concern was that that I then become dependent on it. And then if I did get pregnant, the baby would then have diabetes when it was born, because it would have been growing up on diabetes medication, which kind of scared me as well. Yes. And, and that is actually a fact that can be a possibility. And um, so there are alternatives. And in certain cases, that form is good for by and large, I would say that it's not as um, good. And in our last interview with Dr. Alan View, we talked about myo inositol. So that is a good supplement. So, you know, see your naturopath to get the right dosage. Um, but I see that we've been chatting for a long time. And um, just to keep everyone's attention, I think we'll leave it here. But again, I honor your um, being here and sharing your story with us, Natasha. I'm so grateful, and I know that a lot of people will get a ton of um, hope from this. And, you know, just to see that you're being honest and coming forward is takes a lot of courage. And so thank you. Oh, thank you for welcoming here, Mary, and for everything you've done. I'm so grateful. Well, all right. Thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. And I apologize, there's again, technical difficulty, but hopefully you hear Natasha, I, I heard her the whole time. And for some reason, her visual screen did not um, capture her live, but you get to see her pretty face anyway. So thank you for being here and join me next Wednesday, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, I'll be flying solo and I'll just talk about um, how to say no. Because I think it's important where when we're overcommitted in our lives that as women trying to conceive or just empowering ourselves, we need to learn to say no a little bit more and have more self-respect and self-preservation. So thank you. And again, you can check out um, my other live posts and um, buy my book, Pathways to Pregnancy. There's lots of this stuff in there and there's certainly 15 stories of hope and Natasha is not in that book. So I'm grateful that you know, she's an addition. So thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Stay on and I'll talk to you after. <laughs>